All right, let's start. So today we are going to start talking about deep generative models. We'll start uh, with variational autoencoders, VAEs, and hopefully we'll be able to cover some uh, different variations of VAEs, like beta VAEs, hierarchical VAEs, and VQ VAEs as well. All right, so let's start. What is the goal of a deep generative model or generative model in general? So we are given a data set. Let's say I have n samples. Again, this is my training data. My goal is to learn a function that can generate realistic but synthetic or fake samples uh, from uh, this data set. So that's basically the goal of having a generative model. Learn a function to generate realistic but fake samples. So I want to be able to generate samples that look like my uh, samples in the training set, but they are in fact new samples. So why is this important? Uh, okay, so it deals with the fundamental question of learning the underlying distribution of a data set. And if you could learn a distribution for a data set, you can deal with a lot of other uh, problems that we have in machine learning. For example, you can think about denoising, you can think about in painting, you can think about domain transfer if you have a good generative model. Right? So for, for example, if you, uh, let's say you have images of cats and dogs, and then I give you an image of a cat, that is uh, noisy or has some uh, part of it missing, then if I have a good generative model, I may be able to do in painting and uh, you know, fill in the missing parts. Or if you are given uh, an image from a summary scene, right, and then you want to get some samples from like a wintery scene. Again, if you, uh, if you are able to learn some distributions of these data sets, you are able to tackle these uh, types of problems, you know, quite efficiently. So therefore, we are not just interested in generating samples, right? So it's, uh, it's an important problem, but if we learn that underlying distribution, we'll be able to deal with a lot of these um, uh, other applications and problems uh, based on the functions that we learn from our deep generative model. So that's basically the motivation that we have here. And there are different families of deep generative models. So we'll start today with uh, VAEs, and then we'll talk about GANs, and then we'll talk about flow-based models in the in the next lectures. Okay. All right, so how would you generate samples that look like samples coming from uh, your data set? In order to do that, we need to have a probabilistic model to say how my samples uh, that I see in my data set is already being generated. Right, so what is a good probabilistic model that we uh, can consider? So we are going to consider a two-step uh, probabilistic model. First, I'm going to generate some latent samples from a known distribution, uh, let's say a Gaussian distribution. The, this is a distribution that is uh, very easy and efficient to generate samples from. And then I'm going to learn a function that maps these random samples to samples that look like samples coming from my data set. 
So I'll have basically a two-step uh, way to model the underlying probability distribution for my data set. Right, so step one, I'll generate latent variables. Uh, I'm going to do it in IID fashion. Okay, so remember again my training data, I have n samples. I want to see how I can model generation of these n samples. So what I'm going to do in an IID fashion, I'm going to generate n samples in my latent space, Z1 to Zn. So if my samples are in d-dimensional space, maybe these latent samples are going to be in a smaller dimensional uh, space because the underlying assumption is that these, many of these natural samples like images, they lie on a lower dimensional manifold. So I don't need to use the full capacity uh, of a d-dimensional space in order to uh, approximate the underlying distribution that I have. So these samples potentially will be in an R-dimensional space. R can be significantly smaller than D. And the way I'm going to generate these samples, each of these samples are going to be coming, let's say, from a normal distribution with zero mean and identity covariance matrix. Easy peasy so far. So I want to see how I can generate N samples. First, I'm going to generate N samples from a normal distribution. That's my step five. All right, so in step two, I need to somehow create my uh, samples in the data set Xs from, from Zs. So in other words, I need to somehow model the conditional distribution of, let's say, X, if it is equal to Xi, given Z, if it is equal to zi. So I need to basically you know, model that conditional distribution. So we are going to uh, model this again using another Gaussian distribution because it is easier to work with Gaussian distribution. So I'm going to say this is a normal distribution. It's a Gaussian distribution with a mean that depends on, of course, uh, zi that I have here and maybe with some um, covariance for simplicity i'm just going to assume the covariance is a scaled version of uh, the identity function and let's say the parameters of this function g is uh, being represented by theta so this g function is like my generator so this is my generator function Remember, the input of this G doesn't have to be in, uh, in d-dimensional space. It is, in fact, in many cases, in a smaller space than my actual uh, samples. So this G, if I want to visualize it, it will be a function like this. So it goes from an R-dimensional space where my latent uh, variables live to a d-dimensional space where my actual samples in my data um, in my in my data lives. All right, so that's basically the generator uh, function, or uh, sometimes it is called the decoder function as well, in especially in the context of the V8. All right, so that's it. That's my uh, probabilistic model. So. If you give me a data set, I'm going to pick, um, I'm going to generate n samples from a normal distribution. And then I'm going to basically push them through this function g, uh, get the means and generate uh, samples from uh, a Gaussian distribution with a mean g theta of z and um, covariance of sigma squared identity. All right. so. Therefore, for a given model, I can generate samples. But I don't know what is, what is a good theta. So theta is my model parameter. I want to pick a theta in order to 
uh, be able to generate realistic samples, right? For, you know, maybe you, you know, pick a bad theta, your model parameters, then it is not going to give you uh, a good uh, output as the output of your decoder or generator, right? So the question is, how can we pick we pick good model parameters data. All right, so if you um, uh, have taken machine learning or uh, some other probability courses, which I'm sure you have, you know one good way to do it is via maximum likelihood of op op optimization. So we are going to pick a theta that maximizes the probability of observing excess from that particular probabilistic model. So my optimization is just maximizing the probability, probability of observing this data set that I have from the model that I described. So theta is the parameter of that underlying uh, probability model. So for a given theta, I can actually compute the probability of these x's coming from that model. And since we are assuming we are generating these samples in an IID fashion, in an independent fashion, so this probability is just the product of probabilities that each of these samples x's coming from my underlying uh, probability uh, probabilistic model. So that comes from the independence assumption that we have. Independence assumption. And since uh, you know here we have a product and log is a monotonically increasing function, it is equivalent to just apply the log to this objective function. So we get Basically, when we apply log, this becomes summation, one to n. I look at the log of probability of xi given that model parameter. For simplicity, I'm just gonna write it as probability theta. I'm gonna put theta here, xi. Okay, so that's it. That's the optimization that I want to solve in order to pick a good model parameter to maximize the probability of observing these samples in our training data uh, given that model. And therefore, uh, in, the, in the test time, you know, I can just generate more Gaussian samples and push it through this generator and this probabilistic model in, or, in order to generate uh, more and more samples. Okay, so let me pause and see if there are any questions. Okay, there's a question about R. Uh, you can pick any R. Uh, it's basically a design choice. Uh, usually in the image case, we pick R to be significantly smaller than the dimension of the image. Uh, but that's not something that we are optimizing. That's a fixed number for this optimization. Okay, did we assume XIs are independent too? Yes you know, they're generated in an independent fashion. Uh, okay. Um, so there's a question, why normal distribution? Actually, it doesn't have to be a normal distribution. Right? So uh, I'm going to talk about some other uh, models to represent your uh, prior distribution. So this, this, the fact that here uh, we are generating Zs, these latent samples from this normal. So this is called the prior distribution. It's just for simplicity. In fact, you know, some other models like hierarchical VAEs, they use stronger models to represent these priors. So I'm going to talk about that. There's nothing fundamental about, you know, normal distributions to be used in this framework. Okay. Uh, 
So for the VAE, is it always necessary that the inputs and outputs uh, are of the same size? Uh, I assume you mean the same number of samples. Uh, no, right? So here, what we are doing is to learn the underlying model parameters that maximizes the likelihood. In fact, when you have a generative model, in the test time, you can generate as many samples as you can. Uh, it doesn't have to be the same number of samples that you have in your, uh, in your training. So the reason we have n here is that because we just have n training samples. So that's, um, that's all I can do uh, to maximize the likelihood. Sorry, I meant dimensionality of the uh, generated samples and the input samples. So uh, 32 by 32 images and, um, you know, et cetera. Yes, it should be the same dimension, right, at the end, because you want to, you know, have, uh, have a matching between the two distributions. Uh, but, you know, you can actually think about, you know, um, uh, images with multi-scales, uh, like, you know, hierarchical VAEs that you have some coarse distribution, but at the end of the day, you, you want your distribution to be in a D-dimensional space. How do you generalize outside the region of input data? Uh, I think you mean about, you know, you, you are talking about the generalization because here we are maximizing the likelihood on uh, of my observe training samples uh, but because you know we are learning this function and usually this function is characterized using neural networks right so you if your function uh, has some um, limited power which is often the case then you'll have a good generalization so in the practice if you uh, if you use this function to generate more samples they'll look like realistic samples as well Okay, so uh, there's a question about the underlying distribution. Now you can think, okay, so th this is the distribution, right? So you are, uh, you're, we are basically assuming this distribution of X comes from a normal whose mean is generated by a function of another, uh, it comes from a Gaussian whose mean is generated by another by another uh, a function of a normal distribution. So that's basically the underlying distribution that you have. Of course, it's an approximation, right? So we don't know what is the true underlying distribution is. So we are doing this maximum likelihood to pick a model within this family that we consider in order to uh, characterize the underlying distribution. Okay, uh, uh, let me move on. All right, so how we can uh, solve this optimization? So what is probability of X, right? So remember we have like a two-step procedure. So first I generate Z and then I generate uh, X based on that. Uh, therefore I can uh, basically use the uh, total probability. Uh, say I generate a Z with some probability. My Z I is going to be a small Z, right? That's the normal density. And for that particular z, I'm generating this particular xi. So what is the probability of xi given my uh, zi is equal to that particular z? And I sum it up, sum up this probability in my entire space. That's basically the probability of uh, x given, given uh, this model parameter. Theta is implied here, so I'm not going to uh, carry that index. Okay, so what is probability of uh, zi uh, to be equal to a, a small z? So that's just the normal distribution. So it's uh, nothing but two pi to power r over two e to d minus z squared over two. So what about this probability of x given a particular z? That's another Gaussian distribution. Uh, the exponent is basically xi minus, what is the mean? Remember the mean of this Gaussian distribution is g, g of zi. Again, I'm not, you know, implicit, I'm implicitly, um, you know, having thetas here for simplicity over my variance. 
Okay, that's it. That's, that's an objective that depends on uh, theta, my model parameters, and I can optimize, I want to optimize this over theta. Uh, okay, so first question, can I put this log into this integral? Because it's a difficult integral to compute, right? This is in a R dimensional space. I need to compute this and Potentially here I have G's that uh, are um, neural networks, nonlinear, quite nonlinear. So it's going to be very difficult integral, but if you know, for some reason I could push this uh, log into this integral, then the log and exponents can cancel each other out. Maybe I'll get a, get a simpler objective. Can I push this log into the integral? It's a question, yes or no? The answer is no, right? So it's like, um, you know, you, you, it's not, uh, um, it, is, it is not going to be the same as, you know, before because, you know, you, know, you don't have a log of an integral to be equal to integral of the log, right? So that's the, that's the issue. So it's going to be very hard to compute. Even for the evaluation of this objective, I, I have some uh, issues. Now, like for computing the gradients and stuff, I'll have more issues uh, in practice. All right, so what is the idea of variational uh, auto uh, encoders or VAEs? So the idea is that if I uh, call this whole objective, my uh, log likelihood objective, uh, L of theta, so I want to maximize L of theta, but I, I can't do it. Right? It's even hard to evaluate my objective. So instead, I'm going to have a lower bound on the log likelihood function uh, such that uh, I can maximize this lower bound quite efficiently. So instead, I'm going to have a lower bound, let's say j, on the log likelihood function. Maybe you know this lower bound will have some other parameters, let's say phi. And if I maximize this lower bound over theta and my new set of parameters, phi, it will be a lower bound on my log likelihood function. Then I'll be good. Uh, right? So I'm not you know, directly maximizing my log likelihood function, but I'm maximizing a lower bound on the log likelihood function. Uh, if I could have an efficient way to, uh, to find this lower bound and to, um, to maximize this, then maybe that, that will be one way to uh, find good theta. Because at the end of the day, what I care is about theta. Right? So new parameters that I introduce, maybe it's going to help me to compute in computation, but in the test time, I really don't care about it. Right, so that's basically the idea of, um, of uh, variational autoencoders. Okay, so how can we get uh, such a lower bound? So one way is uh, using Bayes' rule. So that will lead to a lower bound that is called elbow bound or a variational lower bound. Elbow, it, it stands for evidence lower bound or a variational lower bound. It is a really, really simple lower bound on the log likelihood function, but it is extremely powerful in uh, this problem and maybe other problems as well. All right, so what is the idea? Let's start with the Bayes rule. So we have probability of xi given a z, because remember, that's the issue, right? So the issue is I, you know, this, this, this term is difficult because of this part. Right, so let's start with that term, probability of xi given z. Uh, I can just use a Bayes rule, and this is equal to probability of z given xi times probability of xi over probability of z. Okay. So this is Bayes rule. This is true 
for every z. Right? So I want to emphasize it. For whatever z you give me, this, this is true. So the probability of xi given z is equal to this expression. I'm going to apply log to both sides of this inequality. So what I'm get, gonna get is log of probability of xi given z is going to be uh, equal to log of this term. Log of multiplications is going to be sum of the logs. So I'll bring uh, pz on the left hand side. So I'll get log of probability of z is going to be equal to log of probability of z given xi plus log of probability of xi. So I just apply log to both sides of uh, this equality. Apply log. Okay. Um, then I can basically write log of pxi to be equal to the left hand side minus log of pz given xi. Let me actually write that up. So I have log of pxi is equal to log of pxi given z plus log of pz minus log of pz given xi. Okay, it's just like rearrange the terms. Okay. Again, I have done nothing. Just applying a log, just rearranging the term. So this equality is true for every z. It's not specific for a particular value that you're generating from your latent. So it's true for every z. So therefore, I can look at the expectation of this equality over a particular distribution on z. But that's going to be true because if it is true for every value of z, so it is true for average value, uh, and averaging can be done uh, by any expectation. Right, so I'm going to look at the expectation of this for a z coming from a distribution, let's call it qi, and i is the index of uh, my particular sample that I'm computing the log of probability of it's going to be true for, for that as well. All right. So if you look at the left-hand side, log of probability of observing xi. Again, so this depends on theta, right? So these are implicit. It doesn't depend on z here. So I don't have any dependence on z. So this will come out of my expectation. So I'll get basically probability of xi. What about these terms? Yes, I have z here, I have z here, so I have z here. So they will depend on this expectation. So what I'm gonna get is the first term I have expectation of z distributed based on qi log of probability xi given z. Again, this depends on theta. All right, so I have another expectation here plus log of probability of z. So this is just a normal distribution, remember. And the last term is log of probability z given xi. Okay, so that's it. Nothing you know, fancy at this point. Right, we wrote the base rule, rearrange the term, and since it is true for every z, I, it is true for average of uh, z over any distribution that I wish. So I'm basically picking a, an arbitrary distribution. Qi can be anything. You can think about this, pick your favorite distribution. It can be maybe a normal distribution uh, whose mean depends on a function of xi. Or it can be anything else. Doesn't matter. It can be, uh, it can be whatever. Okay, so 
Now I'm going to add and remove a term without you know, uh, losing uh, my equality. So I'm gonna add this term and you're gonna see why I actually add this term. So this is the only potentially non-trivial part in my, in my uh, analysis. So I'm gonna add expectation of log of qi of z when z is um, over uh, distributed over qi. Uh, so if you are familiar with you know, information theory, this resembles like Shannon entropy, this term, the entropy of this distribution qi, and I'm going to subtract this. So I'm adding and subtracting two terms. So nothing changes. Okay, so now um, uh, I need to uh, do maybe a quick review of KL, just a simple way to think about expectation of log of uh, probabilities. So KL distance between two distributions, P1 and P2 is defined as, let's say these are densities, uh, the integral of P1 of X log of P1 of X over P2 of X, dx. Or in other words, you can just write this as expectation of log of P1 over P2. Expectation is over when X is distributed according to the, uh, the top distribution, the distribution P1. So that's just like KL divergence between two distributions. It's just a definition. And it is not hard to show that this KL is always uh, non-negative. Uh, so it is a simple um, uh, use of uh, Jensen's inequality. Okay, so now let's uh, use this definition. Let's see if we can further simplify these terms. If I look at these two terms, what do I get? I have expectation over QI log of uh, basically PZ minus log of QZ. Okay, so this, this guy, you can actually log of P1 minus log of P2. So here I basically get the negative KL between QI and P. And what about this term? So these two terms, again, I get the uh, expectation over Q, log of QI minus log of PZ given XI. And that's basically KL between Q and uh, PZ given XI. So therefore, the right-hand side can be written as, okay, so I'll have my first term as before. All right, so I'll couple um, uh, these two terms first. So I'll get basically KL between QI and PZ uh, given XI. And then I'll couple uh, the other terms, which will be minus KL between QI and PZ. So that's it. So KL is just a fancy way of writing expectation of log of, you know, one distribution minus the other distribution, log of the other distribution. Okay, so basically the argument here is a log of PX I, this is the log of my probability. I wanna maximize the sum of these, remember? So that's my uh, objective of maximum likelihood. So instead I have just used the um, used, uh, uh, Bayes rule and have an equivalent form of that by this formula. So if I maximize this guy over uh, theta, and maybe parameters that I have for QI, 
let's say the, the, the parameters for my QI distribution is phi. So if I maximize this, then I'll basically exactly maximizing my uh, log likelihood. So there is no uh, loss of uh, generality at this point. Okay. Uh, but again, I'm just rewriting my problem. There is nothing, you know, uh, here to save me. So one reason is that, again, this probability, this guy, probability Z given XI is very difficult to compute, this term. Because if you think about this term, probability, let me use another color, Z given XI, then you can, in order to compute it, you basically need a Bayes rule, right? Because in my probabilistic model, I have a model for probability of Z. This is, this, this is easy. This is just normal, right? Uh, and I have probability XI given Z. This is also easy to compute because that's another Gaussian distribution. QI is in my hand. I can maybe pick another uh, Gaussian distribution, but what about this guy? Probability Z given XI. So in order to do that, I need to write another Bayes rule. So that will be probability XI given Z times probability of Z. Yeah, I can compute this, I can compute this, but at the end, I need to divide to probability of X that I don't have. And that's basically, you know, it's a chicken and egg problem. Right? So we wanted to compute probability of X, we couldn't do it, we wrote the Bayes rule, then at the end of the day we have this term that actually depends on probability of X. Right? So that's not good. So we haven't done anything to help us. But there is something actually to save us here is the fact that KL is, as I mentioned, is always non-negative. And it is in fact a quite a, you know, easy thing to show um, you know, I'm not going to show it, but you can just, you know, um, you know, I think it's a good practice for you uh, to do it. So therefore, if I just ignore this term, let's say I, I, I ignore this term, I'm ignoring a positive term. Therefore, the remaining terms will be a lower bound. And that's it. That's the variation of lower bound or an evidence lower bound. So I ignore the second term. So what I get log of my probability of XI is always greater or equal to expectation Z coming from QI log of probability of XI given Z. That's my first term. Ignoring a positive term. So I'm going to be lower minus KL between QI and probability of Z, which is just a normal distribution. So this is called elbow or a variational lower bound, this term. It's a really, really um, uh, useful bound. And the only thing that we, we need is to uh, use the non-negativity of, uh, of the KL. So in fact, now you can immediately see when we'll have equality. We'll have equality when this term that we ignored is zero, which means QI, if I find the QI star, uh, which is a distribution on Z, even though it is, um, everything is implicit, if it is equal to the uh, PZ given XI, then yes, I'm going to have equality, but actually I don't know because this guy, probability Z given XI, as I mentioned, it is, very difficult to compute. So instead, I'm going to maximize my elbow or variational bound instead of directly maximizing my log likelihood uh, function. Right, that's basically the idea of uh, variational autoencoders or uh, VAEs. Uh, let me pause and take questions. Right, so one question is that again about these QIs, any distribution, right? So in practice, we are going to use uh, 
a distribution, a normal a Gaussian distribution whose mean depends on xi. Because remember, qi is a distribution specific for this sample. I haven't even looked into my other samples. I'm just looking at probability of observing xi, a particular sample. So this q distribution that I have on my latent space is sample specific. It depends on one particular, uh, one particular xi. So in many cases, uh, to make it easier, so to make this explicit, so we can actually think about this Q as a distribution on Z given Xi. So uh, instead of just writing QI of Z, so it may be, which is equal to Q uh, of Z given when my X is a particular Xi. So you can think about this, you give me an X, know what is the distribution on my latent space. So that's a sample specific distribution that we have here. Okay, so since Bayes rule is valid for any Z, we can take Z from any distribution, which is, uh, yeah, that's, that's a good response. Any other questions? Clear everything? Okay, so there's a question about the optimization part. So hold on to that. So I'm going to talk about that. But so far, what I have done is just to show that my log likelihood is lower bounded by this quantity. So instead of maximizing like likelihood function, now I have this lower bound that depends on theta and phi. Phi is the parameters of this distribution, uh, if I want to make it explicit. So I'm going to maximize this lower bound as much as I can. Maybe in some cases I'll have a tight lower bound, so in, in, it means that this lower bound is in fact going to be the same as my actual like likelihood when I have this condition. You can show it under some you know, linear models, you may be able to achieve it, but in general, especially when we are using neural networks as or uh, uh, functions to model these distributions, there will be a gap, and the gap will be basically governed by um, uh, the KL term that we are ignoring. Okay, so how we are going to solve this optimization problem? Now, instead of uh, maximizing the log likelihood function, I'm going to maximize my evidence lower bound, which uh, has parameters theta and phi. Phi is the parameter of my Q distribution uh, that I have. Uh, and I'll basically just do this optimization for uh, sum. Remember, so we have like the sum uh, here when we are doing the uh, likelihood. So, oh, okay. so here I'm just going to replace this inner part with this evidence lower bound that I have. Sum over Expectation of z, q, um, z given x, log of xi given z, minus kl between q, z given xi, and my normal distribution, which is uh, P of C. So let me Okay, so theta, I have uh, P X given Z depends on theta. What about Q that depends on my model parameters, let's say phi. Okay. Uh, as I mentioned, one popular choice for uh, QZ given X is a Gaussian distribution, 
uh, where the mean depends on uh, x using a function on x. And let's say for simplicity, I'm going to use sigma square identity as my uh, values. So if you think about it, again, this function that you have here, uh, remember z lives in a r dimensional space, x is in a d dimensional space. So this function is like kind of, you know, the mirrored version of your, um, uh, of your g function, of your generator or uh, decoder function. So this function maps from an d dimensional space to an r dimensional space. So this is called usually the encoder function that we have here. Okay, uh, that's it. Um, now, the claim was that this optimization is uh, relatively simpler than the actual maximizing the uh, log likelihood function. And in fact, that's the case. So let's see why uh, it is simpler to do the optimization. Uh, let's actually open up this uh, KL term here. Uh, again, KL is the expectation uh, of log of the first distribution minus the log of the second distribution, right? That's the definition of the uh, KL. It's simpler uh, to open this up. I have expectation over Q log of Q, Z given Xi, minus log of P of Z. Okay, so let's replace everything that we have. So the first term, what is the first term? Log of P X given Z. What is that distribution? It's a Gaussian distribution with a mean g of z and a sigma square identity covariance, right? So I can just replace everything and see what I get. So basically I have max over theta and phi, one over n, z given q, um, z given x, all right. So the first term is log of uh, P theta X I given Z, which is just, uh, I'm, I'm gonna ignore the constant terms, but what I have is minus X I, I have a Gaussian whose mean depends on G, parameterized by theta. All right, so this guy, Again, I have another log term minus log. What is the distribution of Q, Z given Xi? That's the distribution that we, we have here, another Gaussian distribution. Again, the mean here is going to be a function, uh, potentially nonlinear function. So we'll have E to the minus Z minus F phi of x i squared. And this last term is constant, right? It's just a normal uh, distribution. So actually I don't need to worry about that in my optimization. It's the log of the normal distribution. Out there, you know, it's alpha is like, I, I, I'm ignoring constants, maybe plus some other terms, right? Because when you have like one over two pi, you know, to the power of, you know, dimension over half, plus some other terms. But now you see log and this ex exponents, they cancel each other out. You get like a quadratic term here, the log and exponent cancel each other's out, and you get a quadratic term here. And that's it. Then you have a quadratic objective that you can, uh, you can, uh, you know, you can optimize. Okay, um, any questions so far?
Okay, good. Uh, if not, uh, let's see how we can optimize it. What is one optimization technique that we know it is very powerful, especially when we have uh, nonlinear functions uh, here, G and F, usually characters using neural networks. Yes, exactly. So I'm going to use SGD to optimize theta and phi. All right, so in order to do SGD, we need to compute the gradients, right? Uh, let's see how we can compute the gradients. So let's say first I want to optimize theta. I want to look at gradients of my objective with respect to theta. So this is a summation. Here I have an expectation. So gradient is going to be the gradient of my other terms. And kind of easy, right? So this, this term doesn't depend on theta, it goes away. So the only term that depends on theta is this term plus the, some constants that depends on uh, theta as well. But then the gradient of this guy is very easy. It's a quadratic, it's a gradient of uh, g uh, sub theta times xi minus uh, g sub theta of z. Right? So plus some other constants then that's easy to compute the gradient with respect to theta. Uh, what about the uh, gradient with respect to uh, phi? Can I, um, can I do the same thing? Gradient of my objective z given x. Again, same story, gradient with respect to phi. Uh, the only difference uh, potentially here is that the first term doesn't depend on phi, the second term depends on phi, and we get an objective like this, plus some other terms, and then we compute the gradient. Can I do that? Can I do this? All right, one answer I see, no. And I see another no. Yes, exactly. So here I cannot do it because the expectation, if you look at the expectation here, or this expectation, this depends in fact on, on phi, right? So this Q is, is a function of phi. So I cannot, I, expectation is not just like a constant linear operator. I cannot just push my gradient into um, into uh, my objective. So it is not uh, correct uh, to do that. So in order to deal with this issue, there is a trick, really simple trick. It is called the parameterization trick. Okay, so in the parameterization trick, we use this fact that if you have an objective, let's say you have a function h of z, and z is distributed according to a normal dis a Gaussian distribution with let's say mean, mu, and covariance uh, sigma. So I can reparameterize my model. Right? So here, the, the thing that I don't like is that if my mu is a, it depends on my model parameters, it is also in the expectation. So I don't like that fact. So I'm going to define uh, z I can rewrite z as mu plus uh, this covariance to the power half times epsilon then epsilon is just a normal um, normal uh, random variable and then you can immediately see that if epsilon is a normal variable with zero mean, the mean of z is going to be uh, mu, uh, mu and the covariance of z is going to be sigma. So I'm just rewriting the way that my distribution um, is being presented. So therefore I can just write this expectation 
over epsilon which is now doesn't depend on uh, mu or sigma but wherever I see z I'm gonna replace it with mu plus sigma to the power half times epsilon right? that's basically the reparameterization trick now the good thing here is that the expectation is over a constant um, uh, distribution, a normal distribution that doesn't depend on my model parameters. So I can do that here. So I can do the reparameterization wherever I see Z, I can replace it uh, with uh, mu plus sigma uh, to the power half. And here we have identities uh, as or covariances. It will make it easier. And then I can compute the gradient using that. All right, so all together, I get a function um, that maps from my d-dimensional space to an r-dimensional space. That's my f, parameterized by phi. So I have z here. And then I have another function that maps from r-dimensional space to d-dimensional space. And that's my g parameterized by theta. Uh, and I basically use the elbow bound in order to optimize parameters of phi and theta. In the test time, as I mentioned, I don't actually care about these Q distributions. I'm just gonna throw this away and I'm going to generate Z according to a normal distribution and then pa pass it through my function G theta. And the output that I have is g theta of x sigma square identity. So in practice, you know, when we are generating samples, the sigma is going to uh, be quite small uh, because that if, for, if you use a larger sigma, it can make your uh, images blur. And that's it. That's basically VAEs, variational auto encoders. Okay, so I'll uh, pause here and see if there are any questions. I have a question. Uh, yes. so okay. Is it possible to consider FY such that the optimization be trivial or this complexity actually helps? Uh, um, you can, there are some works that, for, for example, look into linear functions, uh, linear VAEs, then F uh, considered to be linear. Uh, in those cases, it is easier to analyze VAEs, uh, but it is not very powerful. Right? So the, the power of VAE is that, uh, remember, so we, have, we are ignoring this term, right? If your Q, uh, your posterior distribution, this QZ given XI is called posterior distribution. Right, so PZ is your prior distribution, which is normal. QZ given XI is your posterior distribution. So we want uh, to have a powerful uh, Q distribution in order to, uh, when we are optimizing it, uh, this term can be very small. So if you are restricting your um, uh, F function, uh, your encoder, then you may not actually be able to uh, have a good elbow bound. It's, it's going to be an elbow bound, but the gap may be really large. And at the end of the day, you may uh, lose from the quality of your, uh, uh, of your sample generation. Uh, so in practice, we use pretty uh, large networks to uh, basically use as our encoders and decoders. Make sense? Yeah, thanks. Good. Okay, so, uh, all right, so we accomplished the first one. So I have about uh, 15 minutes, and I'll uh, briefly talk about uh, other variations of VAEs, like beta VAEs, hierarchical VAEs, and VQ VAEs. Uh, I'm not gonna obviously go into the details of them. Uh, but you can take a look at the papers uh, to learn more about them. Okay, uh, again, if in the elbow uh, bound, if you look at this bound that we have here, let me actually rewrite it because I 
So we are solving this optimization, right? Over theta and pi, I have expectation over Q log of probability of X given Z minus KL between my posterior distribution Z given X and probability of X. So this is the posterior distribution. And this is called your prior distribution. All right, so one issue that we have seen in practice is something called uh, posterior collapse. Okay, so especially if you have a very powerful uh, decoder, uh, we observe uh, this phenomena. What is this phenomena? It is the case when your posterior distribution, qz given x, remember, as I mentioned, this is like for any x's, you have like this distribution, right? And the shape of this distribution, in fact, should somehow depend on x. Right, this is QZ given X. Maybe for one X, you have one distribution. For another X, you have, you know, somehow a different distribution. But in some cases in practice, this distribution doesn't depend on X. Right, so the dependence on X is really, really weak. Dependence on X is very weak. So that's not good, right? Because you are basically using uh, that information, the information encoded uh, in your latent space in order to have a good generative model at the end of the day. So these models usually they lack, you know, from the diversity of the samples and they are not uh, good generative models when you end up in this uh, situation. All right, so, you know, the source of uh, fundamental understanding of posterior collapse is still ongoing. So we don't know exactly what causes posterior collapse. Uh, so there are some uh, intuitions. Uh, one intuition uh, is that uh, when you have a strong uh, decoder, uh, this term, the first term in your elbow, outpowers the second term, right? Uh, when uh, decoder, which is basically mapping from uh, Z to um, um, X, is powerful, often using, let's say, recurrent neural networks like LSTMs, or some other uh, other functions. So we haven't talked about LSTM. So these are like the current neural networks, very powerful networks. The first term outpowers the second term. I want to emphasize this is like quite hand wavy, and I'm going to say a few words about it. And basically, in your optimization, you are uh, ignoring this second term that, in fact, you're, uh, that uh, penalizes the KL uh, between the, your posterior distribution and your prior distribution. So there are a lot of remedies in practice uh, for this that people, they have explored. One of them is something called beta VAE, which is quite simple. So instead of having just the coefficient one here, you just add a beta coefficient here. And you uh, have different weights uh, for the first term and the second term. And in fact, you know, one thing that people have seen in practice, it improves the quality of these VAEs is to do annealing. Start with potentially a small, v, uh, a small coefficient and then uh, increase that coefficient along the but as I mentioned, our understanding of this posterior collapses is still in, you know, in ongoing uh, problem. Uh, there's, a, there's an interesting paper by uh, Lucas uh, et al. that they look at the linear VAEs. It is easier to analyze because it is a linear model. And in fact, they show that uh, even if you look at just 
the maximum likelihood optimization, not just the elbow, uh, posterior collapse phenomena can happen in those cases as well. So it is not just because of the, the elbow that we uh, have the posterior collapse. In fact, there may be some other reasons that we have posterior collapse in practice. Okay, so that is one, um, one variation of the VAEs. Any questions? All right, so if not, let me um, uh, move on. So as I mentioned, uh, in VAE, we have some design choices. So the design choices that we have, we have uh, my prior distribution, which is often, yeah, assume it is normal, and we have posterior distribution which is QZ given X. And the lower bound that we have is true for any posterior distribution, right? That's basically the lower bound that we have, but for simplicity, we use a normal uh, a Gaussian distribution with a mean uh, that depends uh, on X using a neural network. But these are design choices that we have. What kind of distribution uh, that we wanna uh, that we want to pick. So Gaussian was easy because it is easier to, uh, to uh, sample from. But in practice, we observe that if you train a VAE, the samples that you generate are uh, often blurry if you use the, this prior and posterior distribution. So this often leads to blurry samples in um, especially the image applications. We, we want samples to uh, be sharp. All right, so one idea to deal with this is to increase the expressiveness of both prior and posterior distributions. So the idea is to have more powerful distributions for them. Expressiveness of both prior and posterior distributions. Okay, so that leads to a VAE, which is called hierarchical VAE. All right, so in hierarchical VAEs, uh, we'll have stronger uh, distributions to represent our priors and posteriors. That's it. That, that's the only difference, you know, uh, between hierarchical VAEs and the regular VAEs. So one way uh, to think about it is, uh, first we are going to um, uh, partition the latent variables into some disjoint groups. Latent variables are partitioned to disjoint groups. Let's say I have Z, this Z that represents my latent variable, I'm going to actually not just have a distribution on the entire Z directly, I'm going to partition it to, let's say L groups, these are disjoint groups, maybe you know some of them are my first group, some of them are my second group, and then I'm going to have a hierarchical way to have uh, my prior distribution. I'm gonna say the probability of Z is in fact the product of probability of Z in group L given Z's in previous groups. Right, so that's basically the, uh, the chain rule uh, that we have here. So this basically means Z1 to Z L minus one. So here uh, it is a chain rule. Let me actually give a simple example. Let's say I have three groups. In that case, probability of Z is probability of Z1 times probability of Z2 given Z1 times probability of Z3 given Z1 and Z2, right? So nothing but just chain. Now I'm going to represent, um, so if, if you wanna um, 
uh, have this term only depend on the previous one, Z2. In that case, that's going to be called Markov uh, hierarchical VAEs. So that's one simple case um, that you are making uh, assumption that Z3 uh, given Z1 and Z2 is the basically the distribution is Z3 given uh, Z2. But now you can have uh, some uh, distributions for each of these conditional uh, conditional terms that you know usually represented by a Gaussian, but you they, they'll have their own parameters. So you'll have a, a stronger prior uh, on uh, your uh, uh, on your z. So usually, like z one, kind of you can think about it. This is like a latent variable that uh, represents like rough uh, features in your image. Z2, Z3, they represent finer resolutions in your image. Uh, and based on that, you can have high resolution uh, outputs. So you can do basically the same thing for your posterior uh, uh, distribution. So your posterior QZ given X, again, you can assume that comes from ZL given Z's before that and X for L. Again, for a simple example, when we have three groups, this means QZ given X is QZ1 given X and then Q z2 given z1 and x times q z3 given z1 and z2 and x okay. all right and then that's it uh, maybe you can represent each of them by a gaussian distribution with different parameters and have a stronger posterior uh, posterior family uh, yes so they they can come from different distributions uh, so for optimization, we'll just use the same, same as before, like elbow bound. Nothing changes. So the only thing that changes is basically the way that we represent prior and posterior distributions. So using this uh, in a new uh, uh, work by Rahbat uh, ETL, uh, they uh, introduce NVAE, which is Roughly speaking, hierarchical VAE plus what I would call a bag of tricks. A bag of tricks. Right? For example, how you set the batch norm, how you, you know, what kind of activation functions that you want to use. There's like this nice activation that they use called swish uh, activation some other tricks using that they basically they are able to uh, train really high quality uh, VAE uh, on some image data sets like Celeb A. The performance is in fact on par with like high quality GANs uh, that we'll be basically talking about uh, next week. So then, you know, before, uh, you know, some of these works, people, they thought that, okay, VAE is there. Uh, good theoretically, especially since they provide these likelihood functions and some lower bounds on the likelihood functions, but the outputs are somehow blurry. But using uh, some of these uh, stronger prior and posterior distributions and some tricks, uh, they're able to uh, train uh, really high quality VAs. Uh, okay, so we are running out of time. Let me just say uh, one word about, uh, some words about uh, VQVAE, which is vector quantized VAE. So in the VQVAE, the latent space is discrete. So you have X, you map it to your Z, 
again, this mapping is done by a neural network. It can be discrete. You add a discretization step. So you add a quantization step to map your latent to some discrete codes. This is the quantization step that you have. So you have some discrete codes and that's it. Then the uh, decoder side is uh, as before. So you map you know, these uh, codes to uh, your uh, samples. And the reason, you know, in some applications, it is good to have a discrete uh, latent space. You have a better control on the probabilities that you, you observe in your latent space. The only drawback of this is that the quantization is not a differentiable, not differentiable uh, operator, right? Because you're quantizing how you can differentiate that. So they get around this using this heuristic uh, called uh, straight through. Estimator which is a fancy name of saying, ignore the quantization when you compute your gradient. Right? So when you compute your gradient, you just copy paste your gradient from the output of the quantization layer to the, uh, to the input. Um, and that's basically it for, um, uh, for uh, VQVA. Okay, sorry I'm uh, running again a little bit late, uh, but hopefully this will give you a you know, uh, a more complete picture on VAEs that is in fact, you know, grounded on uh, really interesting results on variation of lower bounds. But there are some interesting variations of it, like uh, hierarchical VAEs, VQ VAEs, uh, and so on and so forth. So with that, I'll uh, stop here and take uh, questions.